How much does it cost an airline to operate an aircraft? Do they make a lot of money or do they make nothing at all? In this video, I will break down several different flights, why the long haul low cost model doesn't work and why EasyJet will never operate an Airbus A380. Hey, it's Nick here from the channel that you're watching. Stick around to the end of this video for a bonus Q&A where I'll be going over the top questions. The aviation industry has one of the stranger balance sheets to explore. Unlike other industries, airlines can be incredibly flexible with their costs, and sometimes things don't really cost much at all. For example, an aircraft themselves are generally leased by airlines, not owned. Even brand new aircraft that are bought by an airline from say Boeing or Airbus are then passed onto a leasing firm in what is known as a lease buyback. This means that airlines can have the advantage of buying a new aircraft without actually paying for it outright. This most aircraft are leased and I've made two great videos that explain in too much detail how much they are. But generally you can expect to get an aircraft for thousands a month. On the opposite side of the spectrum is fuel. Airlines need fuel to operate and you can't fly without something in the tank and this is a cost that fluctuates daily and changes the bottom line significantly. That's why we see so many airlines investing in green fuels and other cost saving measures to keep this as low as possible. So on to the main event, how much do airlines actually make? According to a report back in 2018, the average profit per customer of a typical New York to Los Angeles flight was around 20 US dollars. Despite the fact that the ticket was $323 on average. This sounds pretty outrageous, doesn't it? Here's a quick price breakdown of where your money goes for this ticket. Of the 323 earned per passenger, 34 is in taxes by various different authorities, $88 is for crew involved with the operating and running the flight. This isn't just the flight attendant asking you to put your trade table down, but also includes the pilot, maintenance crews, admin, those in the head office, and anyone involved in the company. Then we need to consider fuel. For this particular route back in 2018 and with the fuel price back then, this was $55 for the trip. Now you can see why an airline wants to ensure that their plane is as fuel efficient as possible as the fuel cost is more than double the profit per passenger. Now it's time to pay for the plane itself. If a $100 million plane lasts around 25 to 30 years, then it will cost around $4 million per year for the airline. This flight in question is only one day, but breaking down $4 million to one day is around $11,000. If the plane carries 187 passengers and is full, then it's around 55 per passenger for the plane itself. Ouch. Next, we have the food on board. If complimentary, it will cost around $5 per passenger. Hence now why so many airlines now charge for fuel on board. Then we have the smorgasbord of other costs like insurance, advertising, office supplies, commissions, and communications for boarding. Lastly, the airline also needs to pay the airports to land and use the facilities. This cost greatly depends on the size of the plane, where they want to park it, and how long it's there. That's why we see some low-cost airlines like Ryanair and others park far away from the gate and use buses instead of a jet bridge. With all of these costs added up, you can now see why airlines scrape the very bottom of the barrel when it comes to profits. Or do they? Looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a report from Qantas with its enormously profitable Airbus A380 flight from Sydney to Dallas. A profit of $428 million in revenue per year. That comes to around $628,000 per flight with an average return of $1,598 per passenger. For some passengers, this is more than double what they pay. $660 for an economy ticket or a good chunk of change for first class at $8,030. So why is this flight so profitable? It's a combination of demand, the aircraft's low cost per seat, and a lack of sizable competition allowing Qantas to charge whatever they like. 
the Australian Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Economics broke down these costs. The Airbus A380, the largest passenger jet, costs between $26,000 and $29,000 per hour. Using roughly $17,500 worth of fuel, or approximately $40 to $44 per mile. A more detailed look at the Qantas Airways flight offers a better understanding of typical costs. On a 14-hour A380 flight from Sydney to Los Angeles, the airline expenditures amount to $300,000, $11,000 in food and drink, $12,500 in staff pay, and $37,000 in airport taxes and navigation services, and around $250,000 in fuel to fly that 484-seat plane. Now we get to the main issue with long-haul flights in the low-cost market. You might have wondered why doesn't an airline pick up an older Airbus A380 and fit it out with as many seats as possible, say 800, and then just operate that flight as cheaply as possible. Well, one airline technically did do this. Back in 2018, Norwegian hired an Airbus A380 to transport stranded passengers thanks to the grounding of the Boeing 787 fleet. Alas, they lost a fortune. Let's break it down. The Airbus A380 costs around $150,000 to operate per trip across the Atlantic, which is an average cost of $340 per passenger with 440 seats on board. At the time, Norwegian was charging around $200 to $341 per passenger, resulting in a profit on their best days of only $1. But what about our idea to fit as many seats on board as possible? Instead of 440 seats, we have 800 in all economy seats. At 26,000 per hour, the minimum price of tickets would need to be $32.50 per passenger per hour to just break even. Or for New York to London, $187.50 per ticket. This assumes that you can fit 100% of every seat and not leave a single seat empty. While it's certainly possible for a low-cost carrier to operate a long-haul A380, the profit margins are so slim that it would be financial suicide to do so. Who here thinks that they can run their own airline? Whilst you ponder that question, I'll dive straight into the Q&A. How this works is that I'll be taking the most common questions that I get from the comments of my YouTube channel and I'll be seeing what I can do to best answer your questions. The very first question that I get asked quite a lot on this channel is what programs do I use to make all of my animations? So I actually use uh, Blender to create all the 3D models of all the planes. So everything that you see in all of my videos, any sort of 3D animation, I use Blender, which program is free, but uh, it takes a lot of time and many hours to create these animations. But I am learning and I'm trying to get as better as quickly as possible so I can give you the very best in terms of 3D animations. It might not be uh, Pixar quality, but it'll certainly be something that hopefully gets you excited every time you see one of my films. And then secondly, I use Premiere Pro and After Effects for all of the editing and laying down the music and putting everything together for these videos. Our next question is about the uh, Virgin Galactic Mac 3 Concorde. A lot of people have asked that these Concorde designs are only designed for around about 10 to 20 passengers. This is because supersonic jet aircraft are designed for VIP transport. I know it may seem a little bit ridiculous, but when you're a billionaire, the only thing that you can't buy is more time. And billionaires love to travel. So if a billionaire was able to travel to the other side of the world, or even just around the corner on their continent, a lot faster than a commercial travel, then it is incredibly valuable indeed. And that's why we're seeing so many supersonic startups. Our next question is about whether or not Boeing or Airbus actually produces their own engines. They do not. The main engine manufacturers are General Electric, Rolls-Royce and Safran. Now, what's interesting about this market is that they're not selling engines outright, but actually renting the engines to airlines and then selling engine hours. It's a really interesting topic and you can expect a video on it very soon. This next question asks, why would you have beds on a supersonic plane? 
After all, you get to your destination in such a quick time, then you probably don't even need to sleep whilst in flight. But perhaps these rich people just want a way to have a nap whilst flying at Mach 3. Our last question asks, why would there ever be a need for trijets today? Well, it's actually a very interesting question because there is one area on Earth, and here I am in Google Earth, that twin engine aircraft still can't go to. So twin engine aircraft can do the Atlantic journey very well. However, twin jet aircraft can't actually fly, say from example, from Australia, they can't fly over Antarctica and then arrive to South America. Now they can fly via uh, Sydney and then go around New Zealand and then skirt around the edge there. However, they can't go from Perth, which is located here, straight directly over the South Pole and then go to Buenos Aires or Brazil up here. Now, why that's important is that Norwegian Airlines, the one that was actually featured in today's video, actually asked for the rights to fly from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, where it had a low cost airline to fly from there across with a Boeing 787 to Perth before then being able to go onwards into the lucrative market of Southeast Asia. You see, this huge market here with all these wonderful islands such as Bali, Thailand, Vietnam, and China is actually really hard to get to from South America. If you didn't know, South America is actually very far away indeed. However, a trijet with its three engines can certainly do the route. And then airlines like Qantas, who are using a Boeing 747 for the route, could actually save a fortune by using a trijet instead. If, of course, a modern trijet existed on the market. So thanks very much for joining me for this mini Q&A session. If you have any other questions, leave them in the comments of the next video or this one down below, and then I'll endeavor to answer them next week. I now return you to your regular programming. And if you enjoyed this video today and want to see more just like it, then consider subscribing. And if you're looking for another way to support the channel, then I am pleased to announce that we've recently just made a Patreon. You can jump on there, you can see behind the scenes videos, you can join chat with other fellow patron members and get access to exclusive live streams with your host. Thank you again so much for watching.